Good morning, everyone. Hey, thanks, everyone, for coming out to support Defend the Guard. This is great legislation. And for the first time since I've been involved in politics, I'll say I agree. This is something we need to pass for the children. <laughs> no, but Defend the Guard is something that's critically important. It's crucially important to me as an anti-war activist, as a veteran, as somebody who had my life fundamentally changed by my experiences in the U.S. military which largely led to me becoming a libertarian activist, which led to me running for office, getting involved, all came back to this issue. Now, Derek talked at the beginning about people joining the National Guard for the best and most noble of purposes, serving your country, serving your neighbors, serving to protect and defend the liberties which you value. And I don't know anyone who joined the US military who did so under anything but the best and most noble of circumstances, only to have their sacrifice abused and used for political gain by politicians with no accountability. And beyond just sending them to war overseas, the constant state of war and the constant state of fear and security theater that we've grown to live under in the United States since 9-11 has fundamentally changed the purpose and scope of the mission that our National Guard has even here at home beyond simply serving as a community resource to protect and defend their communities, their states, and serve in a time of natural disaster and need to help their communities and help their neighbors. Our National Guard has become just another deployable police force to enforce tyranny upon the people when they least deserve it. On April 15th in 2013, I was given a mission in the Massachusetts National Guard as the non-commissioned officer in charge of an infantry unit to provide security for the Boston Marathon. The largest spectator sporting event in the world, with over two and a half million people a year coming to, from all over the world to watch the Boston Marathon. One of the largest economic influence, influxes of cash the city of Boston gets every year. It's known as a bar's Black Friday usually in Boston, better than St. Patrick's Day. But that year, shit didn't exactly go to plan and this normal two-hour security mission that we went on, which was really fun in the past because people loved us and respected us and thanked us for being there, lasted four and a half days as we implemented a military lockdown on the city of Boston following a terrorist attack that killed a handful of people and wounded hundreds more. Now of note, the response of the National Guard in Boston, the response of the first responders in Boston and the people of Boston, it is the only mass casualty terrorist attack ever recorded where not a single person who made it to a hospital died. And that's a credit to the National Guard and the people of Boston for stepping up and doing that in a time of need. But the fact that that need happened was itself blowback for our military action overseas and a failure of our intelligence agencies. The Tsarnaev brothers were being investigated by the FBI on Russian intelligence. We're in FBI custody mere weeks before the Boston Marathon bombing and still let go. That event alone wasn't enough to really change my perception and change my life on what we were doing. Now, Jim Bouchard, a libertarian activist from Maine, author of Crazy Angry Libertarian and host of a radio show, he often has a point he likes to make to people where nobody can ever become a libertarian. You either are a libertarian or you aren't. But every libertarian has a fundamental point in their life where they realize, where the straw that breaks the camel's back and they realize that they always were a libertarian. And this finally cracked the eggshells for them. Mine happened on July 4th, 2013, just a few months after that marathon bombing. I got another domestic security mission. Again, as a non-commissioned officer in charge of a security detachment, not for the Boston Marathon, but for the 4th of July Independence Ceremony in Boston. Normally the largest gathering and fireworks display on the Eastern Seaboard every year. Birthplace of revolution, the birthplace of liberty and the cradle of revolution here in the United States, Boston, Massachusetts. That year we locked down every bridge, every crosswalk, every esplanade, the Boston esplanades, was reported as having more soldiers than spectators the next day by the Boston Globe. And not a single person was allowed to move without scrutiny, search, and detention. We had mobile checkpoints, we had uh, roving security groups, we had 
not just National Guard, FBI, DEA, ATF, TSA, Massachusetts State Police, Boston Police, mutual aid from 39 different local police departments sending in additional troops. We had U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Navy bomb disposal units. At one point, I remember seeing a family separated because they reached the number of people allowed to cross a bridge in a given hour after the mother walked over and they stopped her children from following. But what really struck it for me was around lunchtime, I was walking with my second lieutenant who was freshly graduated from Boston University, had received his commission only a couple weeks earlier and still hadn't been to basic training. And a gentleman popped out in front of us and swapped a lawn chair right down on the sidewalk, sat down and started reading a book directly underneath a mobile facial recognition camera system. My lieutenant immediately starts screaming at him, yelling at him, you're gonna be detained, you need to move, you're impeding traffic, what are you doing? And I couldn't help myself with that burst into tears laughing. The absurdity of it all just finally broke that eggshell for me and let everything spill out. And my lieutenant turns around and says, Sergeant O'Donnell, what the fuck is so funny? Well, sir, he's reading 1984. <laughs> I had to spend the next five minutes explaining the plot of 1984 to a college-educated second lieutenant in the United States Army. And when I reached the conclusion of that, I just said, fuck. <laughs> And as a dozen people turned around in panic because the guy with the rifle just screamed fuck in the middle of a crowd, <laughs> I had to proclaim, we are the bad guys. And that's what this constant state of war, this constant state of fear and security has done to our military, to our troops, to our National Guards, and to our communities. It has turned what's supposed to be a community resource, what's supposed to be people serving their community and helping their neighbors in a time of need into a weaponized arm of tyranny enforcing the whims of the state. Defend the Guard legislation isn't just important to end the wars overseas. It's important to keep things from getting worse here. Thank you.